It's no secret that Avatar is one of the most spectacular pieces of cinema ever to grace screens. A film grand in its scale, visual effects, and world building. The world building in particular being one of the most imaginative and extensive in science fiction. Often its most noteworthy achievement being its magnificent menagerie of creatures. One of the most important of these creatures are the mountain banshees, or the Ikan in their native tongue, a species of aerial predators that are widespread across the planet's forests and floating mountains, often acting as lifelong flying mounts for the Navi. While these creatures may seem alien, they, along with many of the creatures of Pandora, were based on many animals of the real world, both alive and extinct, with the Ikran taking inspiration from many pterosaurs. However, nature has a way to evolve creatures that not only test the imagination, but reflect the works of our own. In the case of Avatar, the Ikran became more than just imagination, thanks to a discovery in 2014 of a pterosaur bearing an eerie resemblance to those of the Banshees of Pandora, a pterosaur fittingly named Ikran Draco. Ikran Draco was a Lonco-Draconid pterosaur from the early Cretaceous period, living approximately 120 million years ago. Originally discovered in China in 2014, with a fairly complete fossil specimen for the holotype or original specimen for the species, Ikran Draco Avatar. Which is, I'll admit, a pretty on-the-nose name, unlike the second species known as Ikran Draco Mekorhynchus which is a bit of a tongue twister. Despite this, the genus went unnamed for six years until receiving the name Ikran Draco, or Ikran Dragon. The Ikran in its name, taking inspiration from the crest on the lower jaw, being eerily similar to that of the mountain banshees from James Cameron's Avatar. Although, with a wingspan of 5 feet or 1.5 meters, Ikran Draco wasn't quite the banshee from the films. The crest of Ikran Draco was unlike any other pterosaur known before it, and it's a fairly mysterious adaptation, as we have very little idea of what it was used for. However, this hasn't stopped a few paleontologists in presenting their own hypotheses. Initially, it was hypothesized that the crest of Ikran Draco could have been utilized as a tool for fishing, specifically, skim fishing. Skim fishing is a form of fishing where an animal will fly over the water and skim its surface with its lower jaw, opening wide until they ensnare a fish. It's a method seen in modern birds, a group unrelated to pterosaurs, but shares several of the roles that pterosaurs once occupied during the Mesozoic. It was thought that Ikran Draco, similar to a skimmer, would use its crest to cut through the water's surface in order to snatch up fish. It's a hypothesis that is not unique to Ikran Draco, but one that's been put forward for many a fishing pterosaur. However, this hypothesis has been in question long before Ikran Draco was properly named. In 2007, it was found that the crests of pterosaurs like Ornithochirids and Anagirids, pterosaurs with their own unique crests related to Ikran Draco, weren't able to skim feed with their crests serving little in the way of this method. In fact, it seems most known pterosaurs likely wouldn't have been able to skim feed, lacking the specialized adaptations seen in modern skimming birds. And it was even noted that Ikran Draco probably wouldn't have been able to skim feed as its primary method of hunting, let alone being the main usage for its chin crest. But that wasn't the end of the feeding-related hypotheses presented for Ikran Draco's crest. Another hypothesis suggests that Ikran Draco's crest acted as an anchor for a pelican-like throat pouch. You see, on the back of Ikran Draco's crest, there's a hook-like end, and it's thought that this end acted as a potential attachment for a throat pouch. Instead of skimming the surface of the water for fish, Ikran Draco could have instead been swallowing and storing large fish in a throat pouch similar to that of a pelican. This is certainly more in line with Ikran Draco's anatomy, along with other related pterosaurs, with many of their biological adaptations suggesting a dip-feeding method, 
which is pretty much what it sounds like. Dipping your head in the water, snatch up a fish, then swallow it. It's even been suggested that fish-eating pterosaurs might have even sat on the surface of the water, like many modern seabirds. Notice how I said fish-eating pterosaurs. This may come as a shock, but not all pterosaurs were fish eaters. Pterosaurs were a very diverse group of reptiles, just as diverse as the dinosaurs they soared above, with each one with their own uniquely packaged sets of adaptations for the various roles they would occupy in their environments. And that included dietary ones. Some as dargoids like the Lacedromius and Hatsigopteryx had bone-crunching beaks to hunt medium to large-sized animals, while others like Sungaripterus used their crunching beaks to crunch through shellfish. The famous Pteranodontians were adapted as divers, swooping down into the water to catch fast, slippery fish similar to modern gannets. Some pterosaurs were even herbivores, like Tabajara, who not only bore adaptations better suited for a more land-living lifestyle, but used their own robust beaks to process fruit from trees. Even Echondraco's own diet for fish is in question, having less robust teeth and even smaller body size to other fish-eating pterosaurs in its native localities. As diverse as a group pterosaurs were, so were the many crests and cranial adornments they bore on their skulls. And for those various purposes, many of them share a potentially common usage. Display, be it sexual maturity, identification, or even different sexes. And it's fairly possible Ikrandrico could have used its own characteristic crest to signal in similar manners. Ikrandrico is a member of the Lonco-Draconid family of pterosaurs, a group closely related to other crested pterosaurs such as the Ornithochiromorphs, a group infamous for their deep, keeled crests that sat at the very end of their beaks, and are notable for having varying crests between different sexes. In fact, sexual dimorphism, or dimorphic traits between two different sexes, is fairly common in pterosaurs. However, being a Lonco Draconid, Econ Draco's crest and jaws may have served a secret special purpose. One could say, a sixth sense. In Econ Draco's close relative, Lonco Draco, it was found that the top of this pterosaur's snout was lined with sensory pits. These pits would have housed nerves that made up Lonco Draco's beak very sensitive to touch. As such, it was suggested that Lonco Draco could have been a probe feeder, sifting through sediment in order to catch invertebrates and small animals similar to modern spoonbills, ducks, and other wading birds. Given Econ Draco's own unique adaptations from other pterosaurs in their respective localities, all being very closely related to Lonco Draco, it may have been utilizing the same tool set to capture prey. Not quite the stone-cold aerial hunters from Avatar, Econ Draco remains a very special pterosaur as it manages to embody the diverse array of life that would not only inspire the creatures of Pandora, but continue to spark the imaginations of scientists and artists in reality.